It's not the job of government to provide emotional responses. It's the job of government to be rational, to think through consequences. We've been providing billions of dollars of security assistance to Israel for decades, and it hasn't provided security to Israel. The emails that were coming from Congress were saying, why aren't you moving faster? So I felt that the only place to have this discussion was to bring it to the public sphere, and to do that, I had to resign. Welcome to The Big Picture, a show about the past, the present, and the future. My name is Danya Akkad. I'm filling in today for Mohammed Hassan. I'll be speaking with Josh Paul. Paul made headlines last month when he resigned from the State Department. For 11 years, he was a director in the State Department's Bureau of Political Military Affairs, which is responsible for U.S. security assistance and arms transfers, including transfers to governments which have violated human rights and harmed civilians. Paul played an active role in the Bureau, approving arms transfers and convincing Congress to approve them as well. But on the 18th of October, he resigned, saying he could not support the rush of U.S. arms to Israel, a policy he called short-sighted, destructive, unjust, and contradictory. We'll discuss what led to his decision, but we'll also discuss the lessons he has learned from his experiences that predate the State Department. Paul worked with the Coalition Provisional Authority in Iraq after the U.S. invasion, serving as a civilian advisor to the Iraqi Interior Ministry as it trained security forces. He was also in Ramallah for a year training Palestinian security forces. We reflect on all of his experiences, how they have shaped his thoughts on how security policies could be improved and the U.S. role in the world moving forward. Josh, thank you so much for coming to our offices today um, to speak with us. You've been um, talking with so many people over the past month, and thank you for making time to speak with us. No, thank you very much. It's really an honor to be here. Mm, thank you. I was rereading the New Yorker piece last night that your apparent high school, yeah. <laughs> high school, uh, 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 somebody you went to high school wrote, and you, maybe you did or didn't go to high school with them, I don't know. But um, I wanted to read you a quote from it, because mm. there's something, there's a question I have from it. Uh, Once out with friends in New York, I'd run into Paul as he was showing three Iraqi security officials a night out in the city which I'd also be curious to hear about. But anyway, if he occupied a place in my imagination, it was an anachronistic one as a sincere foot soldier of the American empire. The news of his resignation left me with a slightly dissonant feeling. If all of official Washington was behind Biden's Israel policy, why was this the guy who wasn't? So we'll get to the resignation. Yeah. But what I wanted to really understand more about was kind of how you had ended up in the U.S. in the first place. You have, you're British, or you have a British accent, and also how you ended up focused on international security. I grew up uh, in London, um, but I went to the U.S. for grad school, and in fact, I've gone there previously for a few years of high school. Um, and I really was always fascinated by the question of international relations, international security. It's what I did my undergraduate degree on, and that really set me off on a path. I had a, a couple of professors um, one, Paul Wilkinson, was an expert on terrorism who had cut his teeth in Northern Ireland. Uh, another, Magnus Ranstorp, uh, was actually an expert on Hezbollah and had lived with Hezbollah uh, in Lebanon for, for you know, uh, over a year, I believe. Um, and then finally another, uh, Nick Rengo, was an expert on ethics in international relations. And so this combination of, of you know, terrorism studies, ethical studies, uh, really set me on a path that then led me to grad school in D.C., uh, which then in turn, of course, you know, set me on the path that I ended up on uh, in international relations, in national security studies. And was there something before you got to the undergraduate level and you, were, you met all these mentors that had gotten you interested in that in the first place? I think it was just always a topic of interest. Uh, it was always, you know, a sort of kitchen table uh, sort of area of discussion, uh, you know, global uh, politics and all that sort of thing. Um, but, but really it was college that set me off on it. Interesting, okay. Because I think, you know, not many people, maybe as a child, think I'm going to end up in arms control. Well, I didn't. I, no. So to be clear, uh, I always was interested in diplomacy. I always wanted to work at the State Department. Uh, arms control was a later development. Okay, okay. <laughs> but State Department was in your mind. It from was. An early... Yes, it always was. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Um, and so I guess I've been very fortunate to have had the career that let me do what I actually wanted to do even as a child. Yeah. Do you miss the State Department? Uh, in some ways, I certainly miss being a part of the decision-making process, and that was a consideration I had to take into account when leaving. Uh, I miss the access to information uh, that you have in the State Department, um, and I miss the people. Uh, there's some really good people there working on some really tough issues, uh, and it's a fascinating place to work. Uh, but that's not to say that I, at this point, regret leaving. I feel like I made the right decision, in fact, as I 
Look on the events of the last six weeks since I left, the only decision I really could have made. Yeah, well, okay, well, let's skip ahead to another question. Sorry, these questions are a little bit in different orders, no but worries. I think we'll just, um, I wanted to ask about that resignation, whether you thought that resignation had made a difference, um, and if that was kind of the goal in, in doing it, or if you just, you know, in good, good faith couldn't do that job anymore. So it was more than just in good faith not being able to do the job. Uh, when I submitted my resignation letter to uh, my boss, they offered me to stay in the State Department, we'll find you something else to do. And I said, I'm not just leaving uh, because I don't want to approve these arms transfers, I'm leaving so I can push back against them. Uh, and so that was always the intent. Has it succeeded? I, I think it's in some ways too early to tell. In some ways, no it hasn't, right? Because the US continues to provide lethal arms to Israel on an expedited basis. Uh, arms that were used in the last six weeks uh, in the bombardment of Gaza um, and arms that I fear will continue to be used if the ceasefire lapses, uh, as, I, as I fear it will. Um, at the same time, I feel like I have created space for this debate, and that was certainly one of my goals. This was not a topic I think a lot of people were, were very focused on in terms of the US role in arming Israel, and I believe they are now, and I believe that has added pressure to the Biden administration's decision making. Um, but again, to date, I think it's, it's not added the level of pressure that has produced any real changes uh, in, in many of the policies. Well, and that's, that's another question I had about real changes when it comes to arms exports. Um, we've talked a little bit about this over the last few weeks. Um, you were inside the State Department and you watched the process happen. And at least with the example of Israel, um, you, my impression is that a lot of the regulations that should control arms transfers um, when they could potentially be used for humanitarian harm uh, didn't really work in practice. Um, right. um, and um, for example, in this country, the judicial review didn't stop the government necessarily for a very long time from selling to Saudi Arabia during the Yemen war. What are the pressure points where actually arms control, uh, arms export control could be reformed, do you think? Where are the best places? Yeah, so I didn't just watch the process, I was part of the process. And you know that's one of the factors that, that I took into account when deciding to leave, because it wasn't just a matter of uh, standing by as things were happening, but being actively asked to approve sales. Uh, I think there are a, a number of gaps within the US domestic law, um, particularly as relates to arms transfers, as relates to, um, for example, Leahy vetting, which is the requirement that U.S. arms do not go to units that are, have committed gross violations of human rights. As I've uh, spoken about, there are significant gaps in how that law is applied to Israel. Uh, part of the problem is that, of course, the executive branch always seeks the greatest possible flexibility in how it interprets and applies the law, and the courts defer to the executive branch, particularly on matters of foreign policy, which are seen as the president's prerogatives. Uh, so I think closing those gaps requires congressional action, uh, to better define, for example, what constitutes gross violation of human rights, uh, perhaps to write into law what is now policy uh, in terms of not authorizing the transfer of arms, where it is more likely than not uh, that they will be used to commit or aggravate the risks of human rights violations as a policy that can be set aside. Uh, as a law, it would not be able to be set aside as easily. Uh, and I think transparency is very important. Uh, there is a significant gap between what the US government does, particularly with taxpayer funds, uh, and what the people know is being done in their name and with their money. Uh, and I think expanded transparency, both from outside NGOs uh, and from within the government, uh, would significantly help. Do you have confidence that if the regulations were expanded, tightened, sort of the gaps were filled, as you, as you said, that political ideology, you know, an executive branch that wants to override anyway, it wouldn't just work around them again? I think there is that risk. I think there will always be that risk uh, because the incentives that are built into the system are such that they, for example, encourage uh, arms transfers. So when it comes to looking at an arms transfer, you have three voices essentially pushing for it, right? You have uh, the company that produces the arms in question, whose profit are at stake. Uh, you have the partner country who wants the arms. Uh, and then, of course, you have many within the US government who want to strengthen the bonds with that country. Uh, who want to, if they're in Congress, uh, create jobs within their districts. Uh, the voices you don't have within the process are those of the people on the other end of the arms, of the civilians who might be harmed, uh, of NGOs who are interested in human rights issues, because it is a closed process. So I think there are structural issues, and I think if they were addressed, if there was a way to bring in more of those voices uh, and more of that transparency, it would be possible uh, to, to better contain some of this. But in the absence of that, I think you're right, there will always be pressures to move forward.
And then on the transparency side, um, you know, you were saying, and, and I know from my reporting, that it's quite hard for the public, the American public, and also the British public, the way things work here, yes. to know much about um, uh, arms that are transferred either commercially or through military aid. Why is that? What are the powers that are making it this way? And how could that be changed, do you think, actually, in a way that really would happen, not just in our minds in a dream world? Yeah, I mean, certainly, and the American system is the one I'm familiar with. Uh, and in that system, there are two main mechanisms through which arms are transferred. Foreign military sales, which are government-to-government -government contracts, essentially, uh, in which the US provides arms and contracts with industry to provide arms to a partner, uh, and direct commercial sales, which are licensed exports. And foreign military sales for major sales are actually, you know, when they're notified to Congress, are publicly posted on a Defense Department website. And there is a fair amount of awareness of those major sales when they are happening. Uh, for direct commercial sales, there is much less transparency. And the rationale that is given uh, is that these are commercial proprietary, uh, that, you know, revealing the costs of these items might undermine American industry's competitive edge. I, I don't find that rationale particularly compelling. Um, but, of course, the regulations that control this are written by the, the organization, the Defense, uh, Director of Defense Trade Controls, that licenses the arms uh, and that ensures compliance with their own regulations and which is partially funded through fees collected from industry. Uh, so I'm also concerned about a, a conflict of interest there, not at certainly the level of any of the individuals who are working, but institutionally. Um, and so I think there are significant gaps in, in what people are aware of and what people can know. Uh, in the way the system is set up. So do you think one first step could be maybe making those positions uh, not fee funded, you know, the positions of those that are overseeing? I don't know that that would really make a difference. Uh, there is still also a concern about a revolving door uh, between industry and the regulatory bodies that oversee in, uh, industry and defense exports. I think that has to be closed as well. Um, and again, I think it comes down to these questions of structure where the overriding incentive is to make the sale happen. It's to get to yes. When a case comes in, it's very, very rare. I believe it's one to two percent of cases that are actually denied when license applications come in. Part of that is because if you're nefarious, you're not going to submit a license application in the <laughs> first place. Um, but part of it is also because the pressure is really there to say yes. And so rather than no, the options are most often either yes or yes with caveats. Um, and those caveats are important, um, but they tend to relate to technology release uh, rather than to human rights concerns. One thing that I think about is the future, maybe 50 years out. Um, you know, we've sent or are sending weapons, and when I say we, I mean Americans, um, you know, overseas. Yes. Um, and sometimes those, those weapons are, 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 make sense, it's rational. It's mm -hmm. protecting people maybe as much as it might harm yes. people. But I'm thinking about the ones that may harm people in the future when maybe our allies today aren't our allies 50 years down the line. Um, I know you had to kind of balance all kinds of questions in your mind as you pushed for various arms transfers. I know, I know for you it's not black and white. There are some that are all right, there are some that are not. Yes. But how do you think about the future then? Like those arms, when they go, they go. 50 years from now, do you have concerns that the chess pieces might change and then the calculations you made today are going to be totally different then? Well, right. And the paradigmatic case of that is Iran, which is still flying F-4 Phantoms. Um, and so, yes, you're right, when we do transfer arms, particularly things like tanks, fighter jets, uh, these are systems that are going to exist, as you say, for 50 years. I mean, the United States is still flying the B-52 bomber that was built <laughs> in the 50s. Um, so you do have to take into account, I think, not just what the immediate intended use is, uh, but what the character of the government uh, may be like in the future. And I think we can have some confidence uh, in partners like the UK, like your European partners, Japan, South Korea, uh, that these are stable democracies and will remain so. Uh, when it comes to authoritarian regimes, I think we have to be very cognizant of the risks of, uh, you know, transitions uh, of power. Um, you know, we see in Africa, for example, where we provide arms or training and then there is a coup. Um, and I think for countries that are engaged or experiencing democratic backsliding, and I think there is a very strong case to be made that Israel is one of those countries, uh, we might also have concerns about whether the politics of the country and what does that mean uh, for the arms that we are providing. It's so hard to predict. Of course. You know, I mean, I, I just can imagine how fraught, I feel like I would have gotten a stomachache in your position <laughs> at the State Department trying to figure that out. Yeah, and uh, there is no, you know, often no easy answers and these are complex, you know, and morally challenging, morally perilous decisions. Uh, you, you know, have to recognize the world that we live in and recognize as well that the United States is not the only partner or only country providing arms into that world um, and take that into account as well. 
uh, what will it mean if the US does not transfer these arms, but China or Russia do. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, you, you give it your best shot um, and hope that the engagement with that partner will lead to a better outcome. You mentioned Israel, and that's one, one issue, obviously, I wanted to come to was your resignation. Yeah. Um, I wondered if you could just run us through what was happening when you decided, this is it, I'm pulling out that letter and we're doing it. Yeah. Um, I mean, this was after uh, Hamas's attacks on October 7th, and I think, you know, recognizing the scale and scope of that atrocity, I immediately knew uh, that it was extremely likely that we were going to see a response from Israel uh, that was massively disproportionate, uh, that would result in thousands of civilian casualties, because we've seen that before. We saw it in 2008, we saw it in 2014, we saw it in 2021, uh, and I feared that it would be much worse, and of course it has been uh, this time around. So within days after October 7th, I wrote uh, an email uh, to, to my leadership, uh, both within Bureau of Political Military Affairs and in other bureaus, and said, uh, you know, I think we need to, rather than rush to arms, arm Israel, uh, pause and, you know, ask two questions. First of all, are we on the verge of a catastrophe in Gaza? Uh, and second of all, we've been providing billions of dollars of security assistance to Israel for decades, and it hasn't provided security to Israel. So maybe it's time to... Uh, think about that too before we carry on doing the same thing. Um, that response was met with a couple of informal uh, sort of calls of yes, you know, we hear you, but but otherwise silence and direction to move forward with processing and expediting arms transfers and finding whatever other new authorities we could use to move things as quickly as possible. Um, I continue to stay engaged, you know, over the course of the next week, week and a half, trying to push back, trying to raise concerns. Joined in some instances by the Bureau of Human Rights, uh, who also had concerns, um, but these were very quickly, you know, elevated to very senior levels and dismissed. Um, and so it just came to a point where the human casualties, the human toll was mounting quickly. Uh, no conversation was being had about whether we should change course uh, and no conversation in Congress. In fact, one of the, the things that really pushed me uh, was that Congress technically does care about human rights. Uh, you, you may not see it publicly very much, but behind closed doors, there is always an extensive debate about should we provide these arms to this country, uh, which has a human rights record that is bad, which has engaged in you know activities, whether they be repression or civilian casualties, civilian harm. Um, in, in this instance, the emails that were coming from Congress were saying, why aren't you moving faster? Uh, and so given that there was no ability to have this discussion within the administration or in Congress, I felt that the only place to have this discussion was to bring it to the public sphere, uh, and to do that, I had to resign. I know this this situation is quite an unusual one. I mean, this this attack on the seventh of October, um, uh, you know, it really set in motion quickly something quite quite um, different. Maybe I added, added. Yes, I think that's true. But I think you know, before we talk about the seventh of October, I think it's important to talk about the sixth of October. Uh, you know, on the sixth of October, a charity called Defense of Children in International Palestine uh, announced that it had been the deadliest year so far uh, for children in the West Bank. Uh, over 42, I believe, at that point had been killed. Uh, of course, it is way more now. Uh, that same day, settlers rioted in the town of Hawara, uh, shooting a 19-year-old, killing him in the chest. While his funeral was going on, uh, an Israeli minister went to Hawara and said we needed to cl close down the Palestinian shops in the town and build a highway around it for settlers. Uh, that same day, the Washington Post reported that um, Israel was cutting off uh, the supply of donkeys uh, to Gaza. And donkeys were important because fuel was in insufficient supply and donkeys had become one of the main m methods of moving supplies around. Um, so I think, again, October 7th, as I've said, was an atrocity, uh, was a lot of atrocity. October 6th was an atrocity too. And I think the really important thing we need to do is to not only say there can never be another October 7th, but also there can never be another October 6th. I, I know that you've been involved in decision making before about transferring arms where there might be issues with human rights. Yes. Um, but it sounds like what was unprecedented at this point was that the requests were just being signed off. I mean, had you ever seen anything like that before? I, and what I meant by October 7th being unusual is I know that there's the, maybe the argument that could be presented that it was an emergency situation. Right. Um, but I, So, I, no, I mean, I, I hadn't. And I say that having worked for the last two years, we've all been very involved in supporting Ukraine, which has also been an incredibly urgent situation. And I have seen things move incredibly fast in the context of Ukraine. Uh, the difference being that there have also been extensive internal discussions about what are the right arms? How are these going to be used? Where are these going to be used? 
uh, can Ukraine absorb them, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And these policy discussions have played out over time. Once the decisions are made, things move incredibly quickly. And I've been very proud, actually, uh, to have been a part of that team. Uh, the difference here was that the decisions were not being debated, were not being discussed. It was simply an impulse to move. And I do understand that part of that was an emotional response. Uh, but it's not the job of government to provide emotional responses. It's the job of government to be rational, to think through consequences. Uh, and, and that's where I think a lot was missing. Had you ever gotten emails before from congressional offices saying, why can't you move faster? Yes, uh, we, we had heard that in the context of Ukraine from some, okay. um, but not to the same extent where it was, you know, within a day uh, of a request coming in, uh, they were saying, why haven't we received this yet? Where is it? And that continues to be the case. I understand that there are uh, firearms that are destined for uh, Israeli forces in the West Bank, um, where the administration is, is you know, able to notify them to Congress, but has not at this point. And there are still questions coming in from Congress, particularly from the Republican side, saying, why have you not notified these yet? So the pressure remains on from the Hill. I, I wanted to ask you about Yemen. Um, I, I, uh, I know you would have been part of, of discussions about arms transfers to Saudi Arabia during, during the heat of the, uh, the mm -hmm. Yemen war. And I know that you were, you were part, I think, of a group that was trying to add in some mechanisms and some controls on those arms transfers. Yes. Um, do you think the U.S. has got the balance right on all of that? No, uh, I don't. And, you know, I think we got it very wrong, actually, in the context of Yemen, as we are getting it very wrong today as well. Um, but I think that in the context of the Saudi-led coalition in Yemen, there was an extensive discussion and debate that did lead to some significant changes uh, in terms of U.S. process um, and in terms of how we approach arms transfers, both in terms of the technical capabilities and, you know, skills and training, um, also in terms of how we think about security sector governance. And to the Biden administration's credit, one of the lessons it has taken from Yemen uh, generally uh, is not just to provide arms, uh, but to provide, uh, you know, institutional development, to look at security sectors writ large and how they are accountable uh, to their own people. Um, so I think there have been a number of lessons learned from that. And of course, the first thing the Biden administration did uh, upon coming to office, uh, literally within 20 minutes of being sworn in, uh, was to suspend two arms sales uh, to the Saudi-led coalition in the context of Yemen, and those sales remain suspended at this time. Um, and even under the previous administration, under the Trump administration, uh, there was extensive debate and work done to see how we could mitigate some of the worst possible impacts. Uh, and I always felt in those contexts like my voice was, was being heard and that I was doing more good than had I not been there. Uh, the difference here again was that there was just no good to be done in the current context of the debate on Israel, at least at the point at which I left. And two questions on this, just, just thinking about what was done in the context of Yemen with Saudi. I know, I think Larry Lewis, who yes. maybe you can tell us a little bit more about, was sent over to Saudi Arabia, I think probably as part of this mechanism that Correct. maybe you were, yeah. Maybe, I'd be curious to know what, what he did, if you think it was effective, and if anybody like him has ever been sent to Israel. So, um, the example you're talking about is Larry Lewis was uh, a Defense Department official, also very experienced in human rights and had worked in the Human Rights Bureau at the State Department, I believe, at one point as well, uh, who had designed for the U.S. Uh, how they should address questions of civilian harm uh, in, in uh, military operations uh, and was sent to work with the Saudis on that same, uh, Saudi-led coalition, I should say, on that same question to look at their processes, uh, to look at their tactics, techniques and procedures. Uh, and to provide guidance that would minimize uh, civilian casualties and civilian harm. Um, and that was just one piece of a much broader effort the U.S. made, uh, including, you know, sending uh, military officers at very senior levels uh, to work with the Saudis on processes, saudi led coalition on processes, um, and, and a number of other mechanisms and steps that were taken uh, that I'm not at liberty to discuss. Um, I'm certainly aware that in the current context, the US has been advising Israel to minimize civilian casualties. Uh, I am not, since I left, I don't know what steps have been taken and how closely that has gone. Um, so I'm not able to compare it to what was done in the Saudi context. Um, you know, it, a, a major difference here is that Israel in many ways is a much more advanced military uh, than the Saudi Arabian or even Emirati military are in terms of the aircraft they fly, um, in terms of their intelligence, in terms of their pilot skills. Um, so, you know, I'm not sure that 
really training or advising is the issue here in a way that it was in you know, five, ten years ago uh, for the Saudi-led coalition. Uh, the issue here, I think, is really one of will and intent on the Israeli part. I wondered if you could tell me a little bit about, in your perspective, what you think the arms transfers that the U.S. is making to Israel right now, what impact they're having on American foreign policy internationally? I think it's a foreign policy disaster. Um, I think it is doing great damage, first of all, to our reputation in the Middle East, um, where we see you know, a linkage. Of course, there was always a linkage between the United States and Israel, but a perception that you know, what is happening in Gaza is you know, the United States has part of the blame, and I believe we do. Uh, and this is, I think, doing significant damage to our relations with not only countries, but with people across the region. Uh, I think more broadly, um, you know, when you look at the hypocrisy, frankly, of how we approach Israel and Gaza versus how we approach Russia and Ukraine uh, in terms of, you know, the, the, you know, true human rights abuses carried out by Russian forces, bombings of hospitals, um, bombings of the power grid, uh, attacks on civilian targets, uh, versus, of course, um, you know, what has happened in Gaza, where the New York Times reported that more children have been killed in six weeks than in Ukraine in two years. Uh, there is a blatant level of uh, a double standard. And what this has led to, I, 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 you know, I think it's been clear, uh, is an unwillingness of the global south to stand with us increasingly on Ukraine, uh, to say, why should we vote with you against Russia and the United Nations uh, when your hypocrisy is so blatant, when you are not standing up for the Palestinians? Uh, and I think even beyond that, it also does damage just simply to, to this notion of American values. And I really do believe uh, in American values, in democratic values. Uh, I think we undermine the argument we are trying to make on the global stage against our adversaries when we are simply seen to just walk away from them or turn a blind eye. Well, game that out for me. Can we go 50 years into the future again? What's, what's the... What could be the impact of this trajectory? So I think there are two models, a model being advanced by the West, uh, which is a democratic pluralist system in which there are both free markets and free speech, and uh, the model being advanced by, for example, the People's Republic of China, uh, or today's uh, Iran, uh, in which there is the possibility, certainly in the PRC model, of free markets, uh, but there is a, a wall drawn, a line drawn between the economy and the political sphere. Um, and I think that is a model that is very appealing to autocracies and to aspiring auto autocrats around the world, that you can have all the benefits of capitalism with none of the problems of democracy and political involvement in free speech uh, and opposition parties. Um, and I think that that is the crux of sort of the, the strategic competition that is going on right now is between those models. And when we weaken the brand of the West, when we weaken the brand of America, of democracy, by saying, actually, even though we tell you that our values are the de determining factor, our values are what carries the most appeal, they don't actually matter to us. Uh, we decide when they apply. Uh, it is a rules-based order for thee, but not for me. Uh, I think it really has an impact, and my concern would be uh, that by weakening that brand, we lean into a world that is more like uh, that autocratic model, uh, in which there is more space for autocrats to say, ignore that model, Step, you know, you're not, that's not real. What I'm offering you is real, what they're offering you is lies. So I think it's really important that we put our values first and stick to them. You seem really passionate about that. And yes. I, and I wonder, um, I wonder what's next for you and if there's a, there's a thread running here that can carry from the, your work to the State Department into the future for I, you. I don't, know what's, I don't know what's next to me. I think I am passionate about those issues and I'm passionate about the future of our world. And I think it's actually uh, an interesting day to be talking about that. Uh, you know, Henry Kissinger uh, passed away. And of course, you know, the Cold War America uh, that he was part of the leadership of did a lot of bad things uh, in the name of national interest, in the name of quote-unquote, Western values in terms of propping up autocrats, uh, of course, the bombing of Cambodia uh, and, and various other you know, military operations. And my, my concern is that we are slipping back into that model. Uh, we are slipping back into that model of anything goes uh, for national security, when in fact, particularly in this context where this is a competition about values, we undermine ourselves by doing so even more uh, than we would have done during the Cold War. Uh, so I hope that the model we carry forward is not the one uh, that Henry Kissinger said, laid out. 
um, but is rather one you know driven by by values by you know some of the people I've encountered uh, in my work. Uh, I mentioned in my resignation letter uh, an Israeli peace activist uh, who who I met, uh, Uri Avneri, um, who was one of the founders of the Israeli peace movement and was proud to uh, step away uh, from military action when he felt it was wrong. Uh, I've you know certainly met a number of Palestinian peace activists as well, some very inspiring people. Uh, who have really taken great risk uh, to advance peace, and I hope that theirs is the model we can we can follow. Uh, how I can contribute to that in whatever small way, I don't know, um, but I would like to be able to continue to do so. Be interesting to see what you end up doing. <laughs> this isn't the end, though. I just, uh, I just, I. You've had a lot of experience in the Middle East, mm -hmm. um, and not to rely on this New Yorker piece or your high school chum yeah. or. or somebody you knew in high school. But I did want to read one other quote from this piece because I thought it was kind of interesting. He wrote, many of Biden's senior aides from National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan on down were only a bit older than us, and their formative experiences were also of the post 9-11 war on terror and its excesses and errors. But Paul thought that he and, I, that he and they had taken slightly different lessons from watching the same bad wars. It's interesting, he said, there's not a lot of people on the civilian side of government in this administration who were in Iraq and Afghanistan because it's a democratic administration and those were Bush wars. So, you know, what, what lessons did you take that you th and what lessons do you think your colleagues took? Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting you go back to that uh, and that exchange because, you know, as, as is mentioned in that New Yorker piece, I ran into the author of this piece in New York in about 2010 when I was taking some Iraqi generals uh, around uh, the city. And one of the things we did was we went to the September 11th memorial, to the uh, Twin Towers memorial, and it struck me and them uh, there uh, as we stood looking into those deep pools of water um, that most of the people certainly I had lost uh, as a result of 9-11 were Iraqis. Uh, were Iraqis that I had worked with who had been assassinated, uh, who had died in bombings. Um, and I think that's, uh, you know, one of the things that struck me and that stuck with me um, is the impact uh, of, of conflict and of war at the human level, um, you know, both in terms of its impact on American soldiers, but also in terms of the impact we have around the world. Um, and I think it's very hard if you've lived your life in the bureaucracy, uh, making important policy decisions. You may know the intelligence, you may know the issues, um, but if you haven't lived with the people, if you haven't, you know, lived, walked the streets of, of Ramallah or Nablus or Janin, uh, if you haven't, you know, had sat down for dinner in Basra and in Fallujah and in Baghdad, you don't really understand fully, and I think I think that's one of the things that's there is just a, a lack of human connection um, to the suffering that is going on right now in Gaza. Well, I'm gl I'm glad you mentioned Ramallah because I have a question about your Ramallah days. Yeah. <laughs> um, as I understand it, you were training Palestinian security forces, yes. which would have been, I guess, part under the PA's umbrella. Correct. Um, and. I understand that you did that with this belief that if they were strengthened, that um, Israel would feel more secure and in exchange it would give the Palestinians more concessions. Yes. How'd that work out for you? <laughs> um, so it didn't work out. Um, I think probably the period I was there was actually the apex of um, the approach to the problem of the Oslo process because there really was a hope and in fact the uh, American commander of the time, uh, a three-star US general, uh, Keith Dayton, gave a speech to leaders of the Palestinian security forces and to new trainees who were just graduating and said, you know, essentially, congratulations, you are the first generation who will be the first leaders of an independent Palestinian state. Um, but what happened by the time I left is that the Palestinian police were often being chased out of towns with the epithet, you are Dayton's police. And the issue was one of legitimacy. Uh, the theory, as you say, was that uh, as the Palestinians stood up, the Israelis could stand down. Uh, the Palestinians did stand up, uh, but the Israelis never stood down. And what that led to was a perception that essentially the Palestinian security forces were there not to deliver security to the Palestinian people, uh, but to deliver uh, security to Israel. Uh, so to go in, you know, conduct snatch and grab operations for Israeli targets, um, but, you know, stand by and create space for when Israel wanted to come in and do its own operations, um, or to provide a protective barrier between protesters, Palestinian protesters, and the Israeli Defense Forces. Um, 
And that led to, I think, an undermining of confidence in the security forces, as well as an undermining of confidence in the Palestinian Authority, uh, who was seen essentially as an outcontracting of the occupation. Um, so despite all the capacity building, and there was a lot of work, uh, not just from the US, but from a broader donor community, um, that really did build a, a significant amount of capability uh, within the Palestinian security forces, at the end of the day, I think the project greatly collapsed um, because no one believed that it, was for, it didn't lead to peace and security with Israel. It didn't lead to Israel standing down. And it, it undermined, rather than contributing to, the legitimacy of the Palestinian Authority. And I think we continue to see a crisis of legitimacy uh, for the Palestinian Authority and will do, I think, uh, for as long as it is an authority implementing and executing governance under an occupation rather than a government of a state. So I wonder, you also have experience in Iraq with the, um, uh, the CPA, I forget the full Coalition name. Coalition Authority. That thing. You have a lot of acronyms in your life too, by yeah. the way, <laughs> or you have done. Um, it seems to me in Iraq and in Ramallah, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like you did a lot of work building capacity within yes. various forces, and then there were unintentional things that happened or unintentional consequences, or maybe not even unintentional consequences, just things happened yeah. that then kind of made your work not irrelevant, but it just changed changed the trajectory of what you were trying to do. Yeah. Do you regret or do you think there should have been more forethought in, in those practices? And now, if you were presented with a program, you know, go go capacity build in X yeah. country, the police, would you do that or how would you think about it now? Yeah, I mean, I think I've, I've learned a lot uh, in, my, in my career and in my work. And I think one of the mistakes we often made is to think about, think about capacity building of security forces in a vacuum. Uh, as though, you know, simply by building a, a stronger force, a better functioning force, uh, that will deliver lasting peace, lasting security, lasting justice. Uh, of course, it's just one small piece of a much bigger political picture. And I think the failure in all of those contexts was to ignore uh, or insufficiently focus on the political picture. Uh, legitimacy of forces being an important part of that, of course, whether it be under the American occupation in Iraq uh, or the Israeli occupation uh, in Palestine, in the West Bank and Gaza, uh, as well as, I think, the question of how does this all fit in? Where are parties playing politics with this? Uh, you know, if you're strengthening the forces of, of one party, uh, whether it be, um, you know, in Iraq or, 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 you know, again, whether it be, for example, uh, Fatah in the West Bank, uh, what are you doing? What are the consequences of that to the political debate? How is that going to shape uh, the ability of sort of democratic processes, of civilian oversight, uh, of parliamentary oversight? Um, so I think the, the major takeaway I have is that ultimately, you know, all of these problems require political solutions and political solutions that build legitimacy of political systems rather than simply security solutions uh, or economic solutions. Those don't work either, right? There have been efforts, and I was part of those too, uh, in the West Bank to sort of, you know, see, hey, can we make the Palestinian economy work? Uh, can we make, you know, take Janine as a pilot project, which is one thing we did. And if we can make the economy work there, then we'll expand that out across the West Bank. And of course, here too, it was first of all, the security did, situation did not allow that to happen. Mm. Uh, the Israeli checkpoints did not allow the transit of goods uh, or, or of people uh, or of knowledge. Um, and so, you know, yes, the economy is important. Yes, the security is important. But at the end of the day, the politics are the most important part of all. So do we need more investment in mediation? Um, Mediation is important. I think we need to use the leverage we have, uh, which the United States has, uh, with Israel, for example, which it, I do not believe has been using anywhere near as effectively as it could, whether it comes to pressing for a ceasefire, whether it comes to pressing for a two-state solution to actually arrive. Uh, you know, I, I think there is a lot of leverage. And then once you set the direction, yes, there is a, a vast need for mediation. Um, but without the international community and particularly the United States in the leadership role that, for better or worse, it has, setting that direction, mediation will not get you there. Uh, you know, we look at the quartet and the role that it played uh, in the Middle East peace process, which was an immense amount of mediation and a lot of really nice hotels and, and you know, expensive conferences uh, and some, some, you know, very well-paid consultants. Uh, and yet it didn't lead uh, anywhere. It was a dead end. So mediation is, is vital. Um, but as a part of a objectively goal-driven, time-driven process. What is Iron Beam? So Iron Beam is a developmental uh, laser air defense system. Um, the president's request for the supplemental funding for Israel contains $14.1 billion uh, 
uh, in defense uh, spending for Israel, actually 14 billion with 100 million being for humanitarian assistance, uh, humanitarian support, um, which I, I believe is a significant imbalance. Uh, of that, I believe about $4 billion is for Iron Beam. Uh, this is supposed to be an emergency supplemental request that was put to Congress. Um, I do not know how a research and development program is an emergency. Um, I think it's an interesting technology and a potentially important one. I also think, of course, whenever we think about air defense, that it should not be just for one side, that everyone deserves to live safely and securely in their homes. Um, but in any event, I, I think that, you know, as, we, as Congress considers the emergency supplemental, it has to take into account what is truly an emergency, as well as, of course, how the items that are being purchased, uh, which will include, of course, um, you know, munitions uh, through foreign military financing, will be used. And there's something else that's notable about that supplemental. Um, when re with regards to Israel. I think there's some sort of wording whereby um, it allows for even less transparency in transfers than already exists. Could you run us through that? Yes, both in the, there is, in the sub emergency supplemental request for Israel, there is funding for both, for military assistance for Israel, both through State Department and Defense Department channels. Uh, in the State Department channel, uh, the language that was submitted by the White House comes with essentially a request to waive notifications to Congress. Uh, of, of certain funding and items funded with that funding. Um, and then on the Defense Department side, uh, it essentially opens up a pipeline whereby the Defense Department can provide any item, any defense article, into uh, the war reserve stockpile ammunition in Israel. Uh, and Israel can withdraw that. Um, and so essentially you create, uh, with very little oversight, a mechanism for the flow of arms you know, essentially directly from DOD stocks into Israeli stocks and onto use in Gaza, which should be, I think, very concerning to everyone. So is, it, so is this emergency situation basically being used as justification to allow even less It is, and yeah. it's interesting because these are not, you know, the, the situation in Ukraine, I, I don't think anyone would argue, is any less urgent. In fact, I would argue that Ukraine faces an existential threat right now that from Hamas, Israel does not. Um, and yet these authorities are not being requested for Ukraine. Um, in fact, as I recall the discussion when I was, as I was departing, this was very much, the supplemental request was under debate and discussion, and the question was asked, essentially, what authorities could we ask, could we seek for Israel that we don't already have uh, that would make things move faster? And people looked high and low and really came back and said, we have all the authorities we need, we don't need anything else, uh, we can do everything that Israel needs with what we have. And the direction came back again, okay, but we have to show that we're doing more, so let's come up with the most creative, inventive things we can and throw them into the mix. And that's what, that's what you see in that supplemental request. Do you have any idea how it got into, into this? Like, did it come from the White House? And so was, what's going on here? Who, who, who are these, the senior officials um, trying to please and why? I think there is a political miscalculation, frankly. I think that there was no anticipation in the White House of the level of popular discontent and disagreement with the approach that this administration, the U.S. administration, has taken. Uh, I think it has taken them by surprise. I think it has taken a lot of people by surprise because I think we see a movement unlike any that we have seen uh, from student groups to public protests to professionals uh, and if you look at the public polling, uh, a majority of Americans support a lasting ceasefire. A majority of Americans do not support uh, the president's policy of unfettered lethal assistance to Israel. Um, but I think going into this, uh, the expectation would be that everyone would be behind whatever we can do, whatever we can throw at Israel to, to use in its, in its conflict. Um, and so I think that's what was sort of driving. There was a political calculation here a domestic political calculation uh, of, of, you know, let's show that we're all in. And I think it's a political calculation they got wrong. And is that showing, is that calculation with the voters in mind or with those who pay for election campaigns? I think both. I mean, at the end of the day, the voters do matter. Um, votes matter. And I think the Biden administration is, is wrestling now uh, with significant challenges uh, in, in many parts of the country, for example, in Michigan, where people have said, look, you know, we're not necessarily going to, we're not going to go out and vote for, you know, a President Trump, uh, but nor can we come out and vote for you now, President Biden. Uh, so I think there is a late reckoning and, and a challenge in balancing uh, some very disparate voices across the, you know, American uh, political field on this, which is, you know, becoming quite polarizing, quite polarized. 
so I don't envy the Biden administration for the position it is in. I think, you know, you are, you are damned if you do, damned if you don't. Uh, but I think better to be damned for doing good. One thing I wanted to ask you about, you mentioned um, when Biden first came um, to power, he paused, uh, yes. yeah, and those are still paused, um, these arms transfers um, to Saudi Arabia. Um, in the UK, um, there have never been a pause in arms transfers to Saudi Arabia during the same time period. Why do you think the US is willing to pause a bit, but the UK hasn't? Um, I think there was some fortuitous nature to the UK to the US pause in the sense that these were um, two rather high-profile precision-guided munition sales to the Saudi-led coalition that happened to mature in terms of their ability to be licensed uh, actually on the day that Biden came into office. Um, and so there was a political opportunity there for him and for the Biden administration to make its mark uh, and to put human rights, quote-unquote, at the center of foreign policy. Um, of course, you know, so, so I think that that was an opportunity that they took advantage of. I think, you know, now, of course, we have to question whether human rights are still uh, at the center of foreign policy. And that, that's part of the question about the, the, you know, the backsliding, if you will, or I think the hypocrisy uh, that is happening in the context of Israel and Gaza. Um, so I think that's why the timing was there. I think had the timing been different and there had been calls within the Biden administration since then, to move ahead for those sales, to, to unchain them, to, to unsuspend them. And there have been other sales as well. That and there have been other happened. sales in yeah. the meantime, yeah. correct. Yeah. Um, so I, you know, I, I think I can't speak to the UK processes, uh, to the UK decision making. It's also, of course, the case that the US provides a lot more um, to uh, partners in the Middle East uh, than the UK does. Um, but I think that a big part of that was timing. I did also want to talk to you on the record here about um, about guns mm. and the U.S. Uh, arms transfers to Israel with guns. Yeah. We've talked a little bit about this um, over the course of reporting, but in our discussions, I, I was asking you, you know, um, it, it seems to me that there's not a lot of public information about what types and how many guns are transferred to Israel, either commercially yeah. or as military aid. And then once those guns get to Israel, there really yeah. isn't monitoring about where they go or who's using them. Um, do you have concerns now as you're watching the West Bank heat up? And Yeah, I mean, let's talk about guns writ large, right? Because, you know, people often focus on precision-guided munitions and bombs and fighter jets, uh, but it's guns that kill more people in conflicts around the world than any other weapon. Um, and the U.S. is a leading export of fire, exporter of firearms, uh, both, uh, you know, of course, uh, illegitimately, uh, illegally into Mexico, for example, but also through government license transfers. Uh, and in fact, one thing the previous administration did, the Trump administration did, was to transfer control over a number of types of firearms from the State Department, where they are more tightly controlled, to the Commerce Department. Uh, a Biden administration campaign promise, uh, still up on the Biden 2020 website, if you go look at it, was to transfer those controls back into the State Department. That has never happened. Um, when it comes to firearms specifically uh, to Israel, I think there are a number of uh, units of concern uh, that those within the administration and the NGO community have raised concerns about, uh, given their track record of extrajudicial killings, uh, of torture, uh, and, and of other uh, gross violations of human rights. Uh, and of course, there is also the risk of the settler militias in the West Bank, uh, which have conducted a number of shootings, including uh, in the last six weeks. Uh, one thing about guns is that they are very fungible. Um, you know, if you give a country a fighter jet, it's not that they can, you know, sort of use that fighter jet or use the, you know, Boeing 747 they have. They can only use that for the role that it is. Uh, but with guns, uh, if you give, you know, one unit guns, that frees up that unit's guns to go to someone else. So even if you are controlling who the U.S. firearms are going to, uh, you're still, you know, freeing up firearms that may not be U.S. origin, uh, for other purposes. So it's very hard to control the flow of firearms, of course, they're very easily smuggled. Uh, it's very hard to control the end use because it is at the individual level. Um, and it's very hard to sort of, you know, understand fully how they are being used. So I think that should be a major area of concern, uh, both for those involved right now in the export licensing process within the US government, uh, and for, you know, NGOs who are looking at this question of human rights abuses in the West Bank. And we discussed the, the, the rifle uh, order that has kind of made some headlines recently. Mm -hmm. It sounds like that's been halted for now. Um, so there are a number of notifications to Congress pending of um, firearms uh, that certainly I was tracking before I left and which I, I am actually pleased to say have not yet been notified to Congress, uh, despite the fact that they are ready to be so. 
Um, and my understanding is that, uh, and uh, I, I'm somewhat bound by confidentiality in some of the discussions I've had, um, but that there has been some outreach from Congress to the administration uh, from people saying, from members saying, um, we have concerns about these firearms going into the West Bank. Do not transfer them. Uh, let us talk about, um, you know, how, how they will be used, who they will go to. Uh, and that, that has led to some delays, that has led to some engagement between the Biden administration and the government of Israel. Uh, and that conversation is ongoing. So I, I do believe that ultimately those firearms will move. Uh, but the fact that they haven't yet, I think, shows that since I left, there has been at least some uh, engagement, some discussion uh, to draw attention to at least this set of concerns. I think those are all of my questions. I don't I feel like anymore and I'm torturing you. Yeah, that's fine. And I really appreciate <laughs> I really you. appreciate having gotten to go through all of that. And yeah. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for watching this episode in the big picture. And thank you to Josh Paul for being our guest today. We would like to hear from you. What are your thoughts on this conversation? As always, you can find this and all of our episodes wherever you get your podcasts in audio form. If you like this, please like and subscribe and share with your friends. And until next time, hopefully with Muhammad Hassan again, Salam. <laughs>